All right. Well, thank you, Lauren. And welcome, everybody, uh, to our May meeting. Um, and uh, because, of, because of all the positive uh, feedback uh, we've gotten from folks uh, uh, with respect to these meetings, we're now going to uh, continue them uh, every month. They'll be on the first Thursday of each month at 12 o'clock uh, Central. Uh, if you're already registered uh, for these events, you don't need, you won't need to re-register. The, the uh, team will actually send you out a calendar invite for the next meeting uh, once it's uh, ready to go. Um, so it'll automatically uh, show up and then you can uh, uh, attend that if you, if you uh, desire. Um, the goal is going to stay the same to make sure that these things stay topical. Uh, and dynamic in terms of the content and talk about things that are going on uh, in the industry as well as challenges uh, that perhaps we're seeing uh, with folks we're working with and, and, and that we're hearing about uh, and that perhaps challenges that you're, you're having uh, as well. Um, again, I'd like to remind everybody uh, on, the, uh, on our uh, briefing today uh, that we absolutely like your feedback because uh, we want to continue to make these things uh, better and better as we go along. Um, we would really appreciate you providing suggested topics. Um, and uh, because if there's things that you in particular uh, want to talk about uh, or are interested in, then we want to make sure that we uh, accommodate those as well. Um, and then last but not least, if you're enjoying these briefings and you're getting something out of them, which we hope you are, um, then please tell your, your friends about them. Uh, and other folks that you know in the industry uh, so that more folks can uh, can listen in and join us uh, as we go. So the next one will be on June the 2nd um, and uh, at 12 noon. And like I said, if you're on today's call, you'll automatically uh, get an invite uh, to that one. And, uh, and we hope to see you again then. We're going to have a couple of topic, great topics uh, for that uh, event uh, as well. And, uh, and we have a couple of great uh, topics today with the speakers. Uh, obviously, I'm going to um, uh, start off by talking about some of the, the more current um, uh, uh, topics, if you will. But then I'm going to be followed. Uh, Sophia, if you'd go to the next slide, please. I'm going to be followed by uh, Dave Bailey, uh, who's going to talk about uh, one of the challenges that we see over and over again. Uh, with respect to organizations trying to implement uh, the, the multiple uh, security technologies that are out there that they need to have in their architectures today and, uh, and some of the things that they run into and, and uh, some of the things that you might want to think about in terms of uh, tackling those problems. And then, and then Andrew Mailer is going to talk about something that should be top of mind for everybody because it's right around the corner, uh, and that is um, the 21st Century Cures Act uh, and the topic of information uh, blocking, which has gotten a lot of attention lately. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of folks uh, doing things uh, uh, now uh, to make sure that, that uh, not only their, their processes and their procedures are ready uh, for that, but that their systems are ready uh, as well to make sure that they're going to be able to meet those requirements. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Sophie, can we have the next uh, slide, please? Uh, can we go to the next one after that? So uh, what I wanted to do uh, uh, at the beginning of this was talk about some of the things that I've seen, because uh, I don't know about you, but I read, read about, uh, read what's going on in the, in the industry every day. I start my day uh, every morning uh, reading um, many different um, uh, articles and, 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 uh, uh, sources that, that come out every day, and I typically end my day doing that uh, because what I have found over my 40 some odd years of doing this is that, you know, every day something new is happening. There's always new information, there's always new analytical reports. And one of the things that I try to do is I try to put it all in perspective and try to understand what all of it is really saying, right? Um, and some of the things that I saw this week that were really interesting, the first one was this report from Mandian. Uh, that came out um, uh, that we had a record number of zero day attacks uh, this past year. And there was a total of 80, which by the way, in terms of understanding the record, that's twice as many 
as the as the the, the highest uh, annual amount that has ever been uh, reported in the past. So that's pretty significant. We had we had uh, a significant number of zero day attacks uh, that came out uh, this past year. And as we all know, zero day attack day attacks are especially troubling. Uh, because when they come out, uh, that the reason they're called zero day is because that's the first time we know about them, which means that somebody, some unlucky somebody, is going to get hit with these things, or multiple people are going to get hit with these things uh, before the, the community has a chance to react, uh, respond, if you will, uh, figure out what it is, uh, figure out how to respond to it with respect to a solution. Uh, and get that out to everybody and then for everybody to be able to actually apply whatever that solution is or do whatever they need to do to um, respond uh, to this att these attacks. So there's a period of time there with these that, that we're always vulnerable. Uh, the fact that these things are increasing in number uh, as they are um, is, is especially troubling because that just adds to the overall threat environment or ecosystem, if you will, that we're all dealing with. And, and in this case, uh, uh, it adds to the number of threats that, frankly, we just don't have a response for until we know about them. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting was that there was another report that came out from CISA that talked about um, different wiper malware that's emerged in, in, in the first quarter of this year. Um, and wiper, wiper malware is just data wiper malware is just what you would expect it to be. It's, it's malware that literally just destroys the data. And, and they're, not, they're not necessarily trying to exfiltrate it. They're not necessarily uh, uh, trying to encrypt it or, or, or whatever. They're literally, this is literally uh, a malware that's sole purpose is to destroy uh, the data that's in your system uh, or on your systems. Uh, so that it just doesn't exist anymore. And that's, that too is especially troubling uh, because that's kind of an escalation in terms of the, the level of threat to, to something that we basically can't come back from, right? Once, they've, once you get hit with this and, and it wipes your data, uh, your data is gone. So that's troubling as well is that we're seeing even more of these wiper attacks uh, come out uh, in the beginning of this year. Um, we still have, there was another report came out that we still have thousands of applications vulnerable to Log4j, uh, primarily due to non-patching. A lot of these are in third-party systems, so I encourage all of you that are on, on the call, uh, you, hopefully you've, you've addressed the systems that are within your environment. Hopefully you've addressed the, the third-party solutions that you're using uh, in your environment to the extent that you, you have been able to. But I would encourage you to stay on top of your vendors, uh, the third party uh, folks that you're, you're working with um, and that you're using solutions from and make sure that they're on top of this as well so that you're not inadvertently uh, compromised by virtue of something that they, they're failing to do. Um, you know, another, another study came out this year that 76% of organizations worldwide, it's not just healthcare, uh, worldwide expect to suffer a cyber attack. That's a, that's a tremendous number. That means three out of four organizations across the planet expect that they're going to get hit with, cyber, with a cyber attack this year. That just tells you how big this problem is getting uh, and how serious it is and, and how uh, we're not, you know, the old analogy, it's not a matter of if but when is, is, is actually passe at this point. It's a matter of, am I going to be one of those three out of four that, that gets hit? And then last but not least, uh, there was, you should have all seen that India uh, passed a new breach reporting law that requires organizations to report a breach within six hours of the event. That's, that's huge, right? I mean, that's, can you imagine, I mean, you know, uh, HIPAA doesn't require you to report until 60 days uh, from the time of an, time of an event. Um, uh, and some states, of course, have shorter timelines as a result of uh, state laws. But uh, I mean, these these breach reporting laws, the people are becoming beginning to focus more and more attention on on shortening the time that organizations have to report breaches, uh, which means you're not going to have time to figure it out necessarily. You're not going to have time to understand how it happened or, 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 or even how, uh, 
how much has been affected, you're just going to have to report and then that's going to follow after that. Um, but, uh, you know, this may affect some of you in the sense that you might have some of your data in India, uh, in, in, a, in a location over there. Uh, if that location suffers a breach, they're going to report within the six hours to their, uh, to their uh, government. Um, I don't think it's clear yet in terms of what happens to that reporting. Um, but my point is, is that one of the things that we have to take into consideration today is not just our own systems and our own reporting requirements, but the re reporting requirements of others that we may be working with uh, that have uh, other um, notification timelines that may be different than our own but because they're hosting one of our systems or they're hosting some of our data, that, that there may be a report that comes out, uh, a report that, or something that gets reported even before we're ready for it to be reported. So keep in mind where your data is. Uh, and it's just like we talked about before, the, the attack footprint for healthcare is growing exponentially. Uh, and we need to think about not just, not just on our own, within our own four walls, but everywhere that we have critical systems or services or data uh, that someone else is um, supporting us with. Next slide, Sophie. Um, this is a kind of a 2021 in review. And one of the things that I want everybody to, to think about when you look at these numbers and these stats, um, and this is a report that came out through Fierce Healthcare this week that, that when I look at these things, I don't just look at the numbers I look at what the numbers are trying are, are actually really telling us, right? And and if you look at looked at the the, the first thing that came out in this report, it said the number of breaches um, uh, only rose two point uh, or excuse me, I think it was actually declined uh, two point four percent. Which frankly, the difference between six hundred and sixty three and six hundred and seventy nine is not tremendously great for the most part the number of breaches stayed the same. But what was interesting was that we're trying to make this case that things aren't getting necessarily worse. They're pretty much the same or they're getting a little bit better or what have you. When in fact, when you look at the rest of the numbers that were associated with this analysis, you realize that no, we're not, they aren't actually getting better. We're actually getting worse. Um, because even though the number of breaches didn't change demonstrably from 2020 to 2021, the number of individuals affected rose by 32%, rose from 34 million to 45 million. And more importantly, it it tri it's tripled since 2018 when it was only 18 million uh, individuals affected. So even though the number of incidents aren't necessarily increasing, they're getting worse, they're getting bigger, more, there's more exposure. Uh, associated with these events. And, and the second thing that I think that's important to understand about this is that the, the equation in terms of the types of events has changed dramatically as well. Hacking and IT incidents is now the number one cause, and that rose 10% from 2020 to 2021, when in fact, a few years before that, we were, we were an industry that was characterized as having more internal threat than external threat, and that absolutely is not the case today. The case today is that we are affected way more by hacking uh, and unauthorized access um, that's caused from, from uh, uh, hacking attempts than, than we are from internal uh, activity that's going on. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting about, about the statistics from, from this past year was that the number of attacks against smaller entities rose by 41%. So when I look at this and I say, you know, and, and this is really, really kind of an interesting statistic in, in the sense that we know that our smaller entities are the ones that struggle the most with implementing mature security programs because of the cost of security, the cost of the resources and the cost of the technology that's required uh, to do that well. So what you have is our most vulnerable community, their, their, uh, the number of breaches or the number of incidents affecting them rose more than anybody else's. The number of incidents that, that, that involve uh, hacking uh, rose again and has become the number one issue. 
And the exposure, because of the types of events we're having, is much greater today than it was before, even though the number of events has pretty much stayed the same. So one of the things I would I, I recommend to everybody is that when you read these reports and you look at the data, look, look at all the data and understand what all these numbers combined are, are telling us, this isn't this we are absolutely not marking time or getting better we are actually getting worse in terms of the overall impact of cyber on our on our community next slide so and what's in the other thing that obviously came out and this and i just wanted to remind you know it's not just about cost it's not just about the number of breaches that we have or the, or the information you know, now we've got these other issues with, with respect to quality of care and patient safety, which frankly is even more, more worrisome than the other two. Next slide. So I want to remind everybody, obviously, the conflict over in Europe is not over. There are still reports coming out on a regular basis from, from CISA um, and, and uh, uh, other elements of the government with respect to the, the risk of, of cyber attack or cyber events uh, uh, or third party um, uh, cyber events. Uh, so we need to stay diligent uh, or vigilant with respect to uh, what we're doing, what we're looking at and, uh, and our systems um, because this isn't over yet and hopefully uh, you know, something won't happen, but, but we need to be prepared in case it does. Next slide. And I'm not going to go through this, but again, these are the things that, that they, re they recommend uh, and some of the notifications uh, sources for you. Um, bottom line is hopefully everybody's been doing these things already and uh, paying attention to what's going on in their environment and watching closely um, uh, the things that are occurring and uh, doing some of the things that have been talked about here. Uh, but these slides are obviously provided to you. So if you haven't seen this before, um, I encourage you to take a look at it and just make sure that you're, it, it matches up with the kinds of things that you're doing to pay attention to the situation in Europe and the potential risks that, that that presents. Next slide. Again, as I always say, as my, as my, uh, as one of our great heroes in the Marine Corps, Mr. Puller, Mr. Puller would say, you know, let's be, go on the offensive. Let's let's be ready for these guys. Let's understand the risk. Let's understand the threat. Uh, let's understand ourselves and our and where our weaknesses are. Let's adopt uh, that, uh, that zero trust model that says I don't I don't trust you till I know you, uh, or till I've had a chance to evaluate you, and understand completely that 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 this we are in, absolutely in a war with cyber criminals. And, and the best way to, to, to make headway or to stay, stay above water is to, is to be on the offensive, not just sit there and wait for it uh, to come get us. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, our next two speakers. First up is gonna be Dave Bailey. Uh, and so Dave, you take it away. Hey, thanks, Mac, and good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Uh, glad I could be here today to uh, talk about uh, successful technology implementation. Next slide, please. I really uh, look to this quote when, when I think of technology implementation, and it's by Thomas Edison. And it says, opportunity is missed by most because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. And where, where that rings true is, generally speaking, there is, while a lot of people tried to convince uh, technology and security leaders that there is an easy button out there. There is no easy button when it comes to, to technology implementation and, and uh, you have to put the work in in order to make it successful. Uh, next slide. So what I, what I have here, um, what, what you're looking at is the controls out of the NIST cybersecurity framework and there's a dotted line on the right hand side. Anything to the left of the dotted line um, we consider to be non-conforming and anything to the right of the, of the, of the dotted line is, is something that, that we consider to be conforming when we do risk assessments. And uh, if it is to the right, it means that, you know, you have a process in place, it achieves its purpose and it's typically well-defined. 
uh, anything on the left side of the line is there's something with an application of some incomplete set of activities. And when, when you look at this is a combination of all of the uh, assessments that we performed in 2021, uh, if you look at the lower end to the left hand side, you, you're, you're going to see controls there that are heavily you know, reliance upon technology. But it isn't just the technology that supports them. It's also the people and the process in order to say that you have a process, it can, it can achieve its purpose and, and, and it's well defined. So, it, it, you know, as, as, as you look down that, that left hand side, you've got information protection, asset management, identity management, security, continuous monitoring. Those things are you know, heavy reliance upon upon security technologies in, in order to be successful. Go ahead, next slide. In addition to our uh, new cybersecurity assessment, this is just a different look at, at the risk assessment when we look at our, our technical security assessment. And, and we've got 25 uh, control categories in that. And you know, same, same process as you as you look to the left, there's there's things that are are identified with an incomplete set of activities that that rely heavily upon technology, tools, implementation, and you know, certainly when you deal with DLP, when you deal with log management, vulnerability management, um, you know, things that, uh, you know, perform the, the blocking and tackling in order to make you safe in your environment. Go ahead, next slide. All right, some common observations. Uh, I, I think some of the roadblocks and what leads to, as I like to say, the perfect storm uh, is there, there, you know, there's three themes that, that we can generally see and, and, and point out is, is why potentially something could be unsuccessful or put you at risk. You know, what are the things that, uh, that could potentially put you at risk in your organization? Well, uh, total, the, the total cost of ownership is generally not determined. Those are things that can, uh, that can lead to, to higher risk in an environment. And, and really what that means is you have technology that, that uh, isn't supported, uh, by the appropriate FTEs, uh, and there's a lack of understanding of what the operational impacts to the organization is when that technology is implemented. The second one is uh, partial or incomplete implementation, and and we do see this a lot. And I know, um, you know, some some on the phone that have responsibility in, in security teams and IT teams, you know, can relate that that you know you you have a technology that has say five major capabilities. But when it was installed, only one of those capabilities was implemented, and, and the other four that uh, that are there are, are not yet implemented or or not mature. The uh, the last common observation that we see is is around, and and I will say this: uh, solutions are intentionally not effective, and intention doesn't necessarily mean harmful or, or mean that you're doing something wrong. It's just the the nature of what occurs inside of not understanding total cost of ownership. This is where you have a technology like a SIM, but you don't have 24 by seven monitoring of that SIM, or you don't have all of the uh, feeds that's required in order to give you the visibility to make that effective. The other area is having technologies like data loss prevention, where the, the tool is not doing any blocking, it's only doing alerting. And you know those are things that can put you at greater risk. Same thing with intrusion prevention. You have a, a, some level of intrusion prevention, but you don't have the prevention aspects configured because you know understanding the operational impacts to that. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So why is it important? I, I think we certainly have, you know, based upon the update that Mac uh, provided earlier, um, I think there's a change in risk appetite. And I, I think everyone uh, has to have a, a, uh, a change in their, in their overall risk appetite. You know, we're, we are at a point where I, I don't think we have a choice to, to either make um, longer term decisions, uh, we have to turn those longer term decisions into short term decisions. And, you know, there is a, a need today, uh, and I feel in order to, to have due diligence, you have to have things like continuous monitoring in place, you have to have multi-factor EDR, you know, some of the key technologies. That change in motivation is caused, you know, by a few things. Some of it's caused because 
may have had a cyber incident. And if you have a cyber incident, those are, you know, those are things that are you know, most likely going to, going to be required from a liability standpoint immediately after you have financial pressures from cyber insurance. We're seeing that cyber insurance carriers are, are, are requiring certain technologies in place. And if, and if the technologies are not in place, there's certainly either a threat of, of not uh, completing underwriting or, you know, certainly, premium in, in increases, you know, two to four to six times fold. And the other things that we're seeing is that, you know, even in, in business ventures, you have business partners that are, that are, uh, you know, requiring certain, certain level of requirements in order to, in order for, you know, for, for business to, um, you know, to take place. So I, I think with the, with the change in threat there, we have to align a, a, an overall change in the, in the risk appetite as well. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna. I'd like to leave uh, this topic with a, you know, with a few points that uh, you know hopefully can help in 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 overall um, implementation of technology. I I think what's really important is is to be able to define success criteria when when you look at certainly security technologies. You know, what is the purpose of the technology? What do you want to get out of it? What control is it uh, is it satisfying? And and what is it going to take to be effective? I think in order to do that, you have to follow a, a sound risk-based approach. Uh, that risk-based approach, um, if you're actively managing your risk, should be able to help um, communicate what the total cost of ownership is and align the right resources and, and, and prioritize it uh, with the business so you can define success and you can reach that success criteria. I, I think um, the key to anything, uh, communication. Um, uh, too many times things are looked at internally from an IT or security perspective and, and uh, without getting organizational buy-in or, or communicating to the business leaders and owners and users, uh, technology implementation certainly uh, can be extremely difficult inside an organization. There are a few things that are easier than others. Um, uh, I, I used to tell folks when I was when I was on site that you know from a, a blocking a USB standpoint, like that is something technically that only takes a few minutes. You can if uh, you you can implement a change like that with group policy and have it propagate throughout the network in in only a few minutes. Uh, but it doesn't solve the business problem, and 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 helping communicate to the business uh, will will certainly make that um, that technology uh, successful. Resource the solution. Uh, can't say this enough. Um, too many times we just see so many organizations that don't have the ability to add FTE count, um, but technologies are, are being put in, you know, on a on a regular basis. So the the model of success criteria has to be either you have to internally uh, grow it and source it, or or you have to look to manage service providers. And and I, I think that's the only way you can you can uh, you know ultimately meet your success criteria. Whenever there's technology implementation, it's important to update and develop the supporting processes. When you have something new, most likely all of the things that you, you were doing beforehand, uh, they have to be tweaked, they have to be updated, and it's important in order to have defined processes to, to make sure that uh, you are updating the workflows. And more importantly with that, you have a trained, you have a trained workforce. It, it, it's one thing, you know, it, it, that's not a documentation drill. That's a that's a drill that says, "Hey, we have a new technology. This is what it's supposed to do. This is how we use it," and 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 train the workforce in order to uh, you know to make sure that uh, that the technology uh, is effective. Lastly, um, and and I can't stress this enough um, with with what we see from how do you put yourself in the best risk posture? You have to be able to validate effectiveness and. It, it, it's one thing to implement the technology. It's another thing is, is it doing what you expect it to do? And too many times we see organizations that they, they think they have something in place, um, but you constantly have to check it. You constantly have to validate it. And, and, and you have to make sure that um, that, that technology is, is, is performing the way you expect to perform. Uh, because certainly the threat actors today, you know, if, if, if you look at, um, you know, the destructive types of attacks that are occurring, uh, you have a threat actor that has uh, exploited your weaknesses. 
So if you have this type of, of attack like ransomware or some denial of service, that means a threat actor disrupted and uh, exploited your vulnerability. It also means that they spent time in your network because some of these attacks, they're, they're in your network for days and, and, and you should and, and you know, most do have some level of protections in place. It's important to make sure that you validate the effectiveness of those technologies to, to, uh, so, so you can meet the desired outcome. So I, uh, that's the last I have on this, on, on this particular topic, um, uh, successful technology implementation. And uh, I look forward to passing the baton over uh, to my counterpart, uh, Andrew Mahler, and I, I'd be happy to take any questions as we, uh, as we end the presentation today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Great, and thanks everybody for, for being here today. I see uh, a, a few familiar faces out, out in the crowd, so really appreciate everybody being here and attending and, and hope this is helpful to you. And like Mac and Dave have said, uh, really value feedback. So, so let us know, you know, let me know how, how some of this information is received or if you have uh, questions or comments afterwards. We're gonna continue the, the discussion that we started last month about access to information. And we're gonna start to dive a little bit into the Cures Act. Um, you know, this is not meant to be a, a training on the Cures Act, uh, but I, I'd like to give everybody a, a bit of an overview as we start this discussion, um, you know, and, and hopefully this will demystify aspects of, of the Cures Act and, and maybe even, you know, make it a little more interesting uh, than, than you might think it is. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So this is a quote directly from the Director of Policy at the Office of National uh, of the National Coordinator within HHS. ONC is, is really the group that is going to be enforcing uh, much of the information blocking and interoperability rules that, that I'll talk a bit about today. I just really like this quote because I, I think it's, you know, it, it's timely and it's, it's nice to see certain, you know, government agencies at least thinking a bit proactively about technology. And here she's saying, you know, look, we send email, we, we buy airline tickets, we're doing all this stuff from our, from our phones and, you know, and even some of the tasks like our online banking, it's gonna involve sensitive data. It's transmitted through these applications uh, and using certain types of privacy and security controls. But what about health information? You know, how, how are people able to securely access their information in the same way that you know, you can, you know, go to your banking app and, and make transfers or, or withdrawals or check your balance. ONC, HHS as a whole, really wants to help push uh, the healthcare community in that direction. Uh, however, they, they want to make sure that there's certain, uh, there's a certain structure and, and certain controls are in place. Uh, next slide, please. Just wanted to start off with some background, uh, because I, again, I think it's helpful as, as we're sort of conceptualizing different aspects of, of the Cures Act. Uh, this conversation started way back 2016, 2015 or so. And finally, in March of 2020, HHS issues two separate final rules uh, on interoperability. And the first one is the one that I'm going to really focus on today. And, you know, the, the interoperability and patient access piece below, we'll, we'll continue that discussion uh, as, we, as we continue with these cyber briefings. So let's talk about information blocking. As I mentioned earlier, this is, this is the rule that is enforced by the Office of National Coordinator. And what does information blocking means? Uh, we've got here a, a little bit of a paraphrased definition, except when required by law, which could be a state law, uh, it could be another law, uh, when an entity knows or should know that a particular practice is unreasonable and likely to interfere with, prevent, discourage access, exchange, or use of EHI. And when, when we're thinking about providers in particular, and I'll get to this in just a minute, uh, intent matters. So we know that even though we don't have some of the enforcement rules finalized yet, so we don't know exactly what some of these penalties or disincentives will look like, we do know that they, they are going to be looking at, at intent here and you know, looking at providers who who know or should know that a practice is unreasonable. Uh, information blocking applies to healthcare providers, which is a pretty, uh, the, the scope of that's pretty, pretty large, uh, hospitals, um, clinics, et cetera. Uh, it also applies to technology, health information technology developers, 
as well as uh, HIEs and HINs, so health information exchanges and networks. And what's unique here is, is we're seeing you know, HIT developers and HIEs and HINs sort of being brought into uh, more of a regulated fold uh, than, than providers. We know providers, you know, everybody here probably, I think most, most of you on the call come from a provider background and uh, you've, you've been dealing with HIPAA for a long time. This changes things a little bit. Uh, penalties are going to be up to a million dollars per violation for developers, exchanges, and networks. They're, again, they're still working through that, finalizing that rule, so that could change, but it's a, it's a pretty hefty penalty. And then, as I mentioned earlier, violations by providers, uh, that's going to happen through disincentives. We don't know exactly what that means yet, uh, but they've said that they are going to encourage providers to not block information by using certain disincentives and then referring to the appropriate agency. So for example, if, if there is a request for access, it's denied, uh, there's a valid complaint that's filed to ONC. ONC may then turn to its you know, brother or sister organization, OCR, and say, OCR, you know, take it from here, this is an access issue. And then you've, you've got you know, ONC and OCR at least mingling around in your policies and practices, which, which we want to avoid. Uh, just briefly, and, and again, we'll go into this uh, in detail in another session, but the second rule is the interoperability and patient access. This is the rule dealing with the APIs, you know, patient access, provider directory, payer to payer. Really what we're talking about here is making sure health information is, is flowing both securely, but more importantly, it's flowing. And, uh, and then the other note here, this is uh, important for providers. Uh, they're going to require event notifications around admission, discharge, and transfer. So something to look at, you know, again, we'll dive a bit deeper at another, at another time, but if you're interested, the ONC has a very, very helpful website, and, and I'll point you to some of those uh, links in just a minute. Uh, next slide. So why are we talking about this now? Um, there, this has been a long process. I'm sure many of you have probably been involved in lots of committee meetings and, and other meetings to try to implement aspects of, of this complicated act of the Cures Act. So it's, it's been, hopefully it's been moving along within your organizations for some time, but uh, if it hasn't been, you know, you're, you're not alone. Um, many, many organizations are really grappling, figuring out exactly how to implement aspects of this. But here you can see these are the, the applicability uh, dates and timelines here starting in 2020. And really what we're focused on today is, uh, is, the, is the very last sort of yellow bubble at the end of 2022, which says on and after October 6, 2022, the EHI definition no longer limited to the data in uh, the US CDI. So we have a, what we have here, at least, you know, without knowing what EHI is and, and US uh, CDI is at this point, we know at least that, that they are expanding the definition of what is going to be regulated data under, uh, under this act. So let's, if we go to the next slide, let's talk a bit about EHI and, uh, and US CDI. So USDDI, this is, this is really an initiative that finalized the transition from, from the uh, common clinical data set to a new type of a data set called the USCDI. I, I, it's probably very, uh, went over my head, probably goes over many of your heads, but, uh, but those of you in IT, this, this hopefully is, or billing reimbursement, hopefully this is very familiar to you. The USCDI establishes a minimum set of data classes that are required to be inoperable in order to, to get uh, benefits, qualify for certain incentives, and it sets the foundation for sharing of, uh, of health information. So some examples of this, you know, allergies, clinical notes, lab tests, it is a, all you really need to know about USCDI is that it's a subset of, of what electronic health information is. And the reason why ONC even spoke about USCDI and EHI is because they wanted to give people an opportunity to get used to the information blocking and interoperability aspects. They wanted to give them a smaller subset. You know, many organizations are already transmitting this data. And, uh, and so they really wanted to help people sort of build up to, uh, to, to what they eventually will need to do. As I mentioned earlier, before October of this year, uh, EHI is limited to those USCDI elements. 
Um, and like I, like I said a minute ago, just building off of that, limitations was established to create a transparent, predictable starting point. Uh, this, this language comes directly from, from ONC. Uh, so what's an example of this? What, where where do we, would we maybe see you know, USCDI or EHI? Um, one example that's come up before, and, and those of you who have heard Marty talk, she is, she's mentioned this one as well, uh, scanned images. So, you know, under, uh, under the, the USCDI framework, scanned images like, you know, x-rays and uh, MRIs, those sorts of things, uh, may, not, may, may not be part of the, uh, the USD, uh, I'm sorry, the USCDI uh, elements, but could be protected health information or EHI. So there are some, there are some examples of documentation, you know, that, that providers would need to, uh, would need to be able to make accessible or transfer after October of this year that maybe they didn't before. So just some things to think about there and, and happy to sort of think with, you know, those of you who have questions about this, think through other examples uh, after the session. Uh, next slide, please. So what is EHI? EHI is Electronic Protected Health Information. And this is where uh, ONC uh, starts to get into a, um, what I would say is maybe a very confusing way of trying to define something. Uh, so ONC says EHI is PHI, and it references HIPAA. But then it says, regardless of whether the group of records are used or maintained by or for a covered entity with a couple exclusions. So what, what does that mean? Um, well, what it means is that HHS and, and ONC are essentially opening up uh, the door to data that was not regulated uh, in terms of access to information under HIPAA that is now going to be regulated under the Cures Act. So one example might be a, a provider who, a healthcare provider who doesn't uh, bill insurance or conduct standard transactions, maybe a chiropractor, for example, somebody who would meet the definition of a provider and who is not subject to HIPAA. Um, you know, other examples might be a, a healthcare component of a, or a non-healthcare component of a covered entity. So for example, you know, uh, those of you who maybe are involved in clinical research that may be part of, uh, of your healthcare component. It may be PHI, or depending on what type of organization you are, like a university, it may be part of your hybrid entity and carved out. This brings it in. So the, the, the Cures Act starts to bring in all of this EHI uh, that is now subject to the information blocking rule that, uh, that really was not part of the discussion uh, in, in the HIPAA privacy, security, or breach notification rules. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go through these next slides sort of briefly, but again, happy to answer any questions about them. So who's subject to this, uh, to, to this information blocking rule? Uh, the big one, healthcare providers, um, again, hospitals, clinics, uh, et cetera. Uh, they are going to be subject. Uh, health information networks or exchanges are going to be subject. So those groups usually, you know, they, they exist through Medicare, Medicaid funding uh, within the state to help transfer information about patients, uh, sometimes for public health, sometimes for treatment, uh, and then H health IT developers. And what's interesting about the definition here is that you can be you can be an actor in multiple ways. So you could be a provider and a developer because the IT developer definition says that it could be a, uh, you know, it's, it's a health IT developer is an individual or entity that develops or offers. <clears throat> so if you think about what does offering mean? Uh, offering could mean offering your EHR to, to other entities or organizations. So something that you'll really want to think through, you know, as you're doing this analysis and assessment of what kind of actor you are, because like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's going to be different penalties uh, and, uh, and, and you'll want to have, have those kinds of questions and issues as part of your uh, your risk analysis or risk assessment that you're doing, uh, you know, throughout the year. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we want to know here, and again, not intended to go into, you know, training around information blocking, but wanting to give an overview. There's seven different uh, types of information blocking, so I'll go through them, and and then you feel free to dive deeper, or ask us afterwards. Practices that restrict authorized access, exchange, or use under a state or federal law. And, this, and then we get, it gets sort of interesting. Implementing health IT in non-standard ways 
that are likely to substantially increase the burden of accessing or using EHI. I'll give an example of that in just a minute. Limiting or restricting the interoperability of health IT, uh, implementing health IT in ways that are likely to restrict access exchange or use with respect to exporting. So you can you can sort of see how they're uh, they're they're really starting to to help us figure out what information blocking is. We can go to the next slide. Acts that lead to fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, restrictions on access exchange and use uh, in contracts. So this is uh, this is why it's going to be important. And I'll say this uh, in a couple slides. Important to go back and look at your uh, your business associate agreements, your other contracts that involve the transmission of of EHI to make sure that there aren't restrictions uh, in those contracts that that run afoul of of state law or or the uh, the Cures Act, and then rent seeking. So what's an example of uh, of, some, of where we could see an information blocking practice. Uh, here at the bottom, um, so we have an EHR developer uh, who has a patient portal. Uh, that, that patient portal does have the ability for patients uh, to directly transmit a request uh, of their EHI to a third party. So for example, a, a patient portal that has an ability for, for me to send information to, uh, to a family member, to an attorney, uh, to, to another entity or even to an app. However, even though that capability exists, the provider has not enabled that function. So this could be an example of where, where we're seeing technology and process start to run together. And, uh, and we're, seeing a, we're seeing an example here that could be, could be information blocking. Next slide, please. There are eight exceptions, so that's some good news. Uh, and we'll dive into this at, a, at, at, again, a later date because these can become very complicated. But it is important for you to know, and hopefully it, it, it helps, you know, many of you sleep at night. It's helpful to know that there are eight exceptions uh, to this rule. And there's ways that you can, um, you know, you can use these exceptions to, to appropriately deny access to, uh, to data. So it's, it's not a, you know, you have to give people access to data all the time and in any way, you know, on demand. There are some exceptions, even though HHS is really trying to encourage us to, uh, to, to really give that information to patients and, and to others uh, on demand. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, this is some data that I pulled directly from the Office of National Coordinator that show, gives us a snapshot of of, uh, of the complaint process and what they've been reviewing over the past year. Uh, you can see here they've, they've received uh, about 370 or so submissions as of the end of March. The vast, I mean, overwhelming majority, 341, overwhelming majority, ONC has said that these are valid. There's a valid claim of information blocking here. They were only able to throw out 28. So what that tells us is that our patients are educated, people are educated, uh, they know what, you know, I think maybe intuitively what information blocking looks like, and, uh, and they're starting to use this portal uh, to report it. Uh, claims by potential actor, uh, vast majority healthcare providers. I think that, uh, I, I assume that will continue to remain the largest for a period of time and may over, you know, may over time we see IT developers uh, gaining some ground there. And then the claims count uh, by type of uh, claimant, I mentioned this last uh, in, the, in the last presentation, overwhelming majority uh, of these cases are filed directly by a single patient. So what does that, you know, what does that tell us? It tells us the importance of communication with patients, the importance of training our staff and workforce to understand how to interact with somebody when, uh, when they do request access. So there's, there are a number of moving parts there, but it, it's incredibly vital that we're, we're able to have these conversations with patients in a way that that minimizes, you know, any risk and also any risk to our organization, and also is uh, in a way that facilitates access to their records. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the uh, this is my final slide here. Uh, the time to assess is is now. You've got a, you've got a short window here uh, until October uh, before the scope of the data becomes exponential or potentially exponentially larger. And what, what are some things you should be thinking about? Um, there's, you know, really seven key things that you really want to assess if you haven't already. 
you want to figure out what type of actor you are, and you might be multiple types of actors. You need to figure out where your EHI is. And like I mentioned earlier, EHI may not just may not only be where your PHI is. It could be larger than that. Uh, make sure you're looking at your policies and procedures related to information sharing and paying close attention to uh, information sharing to patients and information sharing to third parties. What's our policy? What's our practice? And, and have we trained people on it? Then we need to update policies and procedures to conform with the new rules because there's new aspects of these rules that, that will require us to go back and, and add some things to our policies. Let's look at contracts, including BAAs, doing some type of a review or sample review to see if there are uh, restrictions that, that could run up against uh, the requirements. You know, as Dave mentioned earlier, training and training education, just such a vital part of any compliance program. People need to understand how to respond uh, when somebody asks for data or somebody calls in and says, why can't I, you know, why can't I send documentation to the patient portal? Um, you want to make sure that your, your people that are on point know how to manage that discussion. And then finally, you know, as we're thinking about interoperability, let's look at the APIs that we're using, if any. Um, you know, are, are, we do, do, are we maintaining our own APIs? Uh, are we using, you know, third parties? Uh, and, and how are we doing this? Are we doing it securely um, or are we restricting it? You know, do we have a policy, for example, that says we will never share data with a third party application? Well, that, that could be a problem under the Cures Act. So make sure you're looking at, at your policies and how that data is flowing between uh, between interfaces. And with that, I think I am I think I'm turning it back over to uh, to Lauren or Mac. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Stay stay there, uh, Dave. If you would join us uh, now as well. A uh, couple of questions. First question uh, is is a uh, administrative one, which is, can we share the slides with staff? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're providing this information to you <clears throat> for educational purposes, and we hope that you uh, find a use of it. And, and if that means using it uh, with your staff, that's absolutely uh, what we hope you do. So, absolutely. Uh, next slide, next question, Andrew, this one's for you. Great. It says, if you're a large eligible provider health center and moving off a legacy EHR that is not 21st century uh, CARES Act compliant, but will be in the summer of 2023, meaning I'm assuming the new system, uh, will will there be allowance, allowances allowed? And I think this gets to the timelines, Andrew, in terms of when do they have to be compliant with the act with respect to information sharing and what happens if they're in the in the process of a transition when that occurs? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, there, there are a number of, of unknowns. Um, the, there, the first big unknown is what are the penalties going to look like? Um, and the second big unknown is, you know, are they going to treat the EHRs differently than they're going to treat the providers? The, these are two things that ONC has been kicking around and there's some, some actually very interesting guidance and FAQs on their site. Um, what I would say is, you know, first, probably a good idea to talk to your general counsel if they're not already involved and make sure that they're very involved in this conversation. Um, the applicability dates remain the same. So whether or not, you know, you're, uh, you're, you know, technologically able to comply or not, if you meet uh, you know, if you meet the definition of an actor, uh, you have EHI, uh, you're going to be subject to the rule, but we don't know exactly how ONC is going to enforce that. Uh, you know, we we're still waiting on a final rule and, and it probably will come sometime this year and we'll have a bit more, a bit more information. Um, I would say the most important thing though, make, make sure if you haven't already had that conversation with general counsel and see if there are some other options. Uh, you know, they may be able, for example, to, to have a conversation with the EHR's counsel and, and they may learn something uh, and it may be able to do something that may be what's more difficult to do on the, on the technological or the compliance side. Okay. Lauren, are there, is there another question? There are no more questions in the Q&A. Okay. 
All right, well, I think we're at the top of the hour. So uh, if there aren't any more questions uh, right now, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and end the session. Uh, if you have additional questions or other questions, you can always send those to Lauren and uh, she will get them uh, to one of the three of us and we will certainly uh, get an answer for you. And when we get an answer for you, we will send uh, your question as well as the answer back out to everybody uh, so that everybody has the benefit of, of, uh, of the question asked and the answer given. Uh, so again, thank you very much for attending uh, this month. We look forward to seeing you on June the 2nd. Um, and uh, we're gonna have a little bit different uh, uh, um, topics on, on June the 2nd. One of those topics is going to be on medical device security with our lead uh, medical device uh, security engineer uh, who has been uh, both on the clinical engineering side as well as the security side. Uh, and I forget what our, our second, oh no, I, I don't. It's Andrew. Andrew's going to be back. And Andrew's going to take those eight exceptions with respect to information uh, blocking and he's going to take you through uh, a, uh, a session on each and every one of those and give you examples of those so that you uh, really understand what those exceptions are and how they may apply. So we look forward to seeing you uh, next month in June and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, Lauren's up to you. all yours. All right, thanks everybody.